Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Andrew and I talk general investing concepts. To get even more content from me and Andrew, sign up for the Focus Compounding app. The Focus Compounding app costs $7.95 a month. It comes with a bunch of 2,000-word articles from me each week, a fresh batch of five-minute videos from the both of us, along with one bonus extra-long episode of the podcast each Saturday, and immediate access to our complete backlog of 200-plus episodes. To sign up, go to focuscompounding.com slash app or wherever apps are sold. And now here's Andrew with your regularly scheduled podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. Uh, in today's podcast, we are going to be spending some time going over a book that you've been, that you did reread and that I have been rereading per your request. Okay. Uh, and that is The Outsiders. Mm-hmm. It's a great book. A lot of investors recommend it uh, by William Thorndike Jr. I never, I never see people put the junior part on there. I just always hear William Thorndike. So let's let's give credit to the right person, Junior. Um, eight unconventional CEOs and their radically rational blueprint for success. Mm-hmm. And um, Warren Buffett is in this book, and uh, they quote him a few different times in this book as well. Um, but I re- I read this book probably three years ago, and okay. based on your recommendation, like I said, um, I've been rereading it, and they go over a bunch of different situations. Tom Murphy in Capital Cities, Henry Singleton in Teledyne, um, John Malone in TCI, Catherine Graham in the Washington Post. Why do you like this book so much? Um, it has historical information on each of those. Uh, there's some other ones in it. Uh, there's the General Dynamics one. There's Ralston Perina and there's General Cinema. The ones that I think are most interesting for people to read are uh, Tom Murphy, Cap Cities, Henry Singleton, Teledyne, John Malone, TCI, and then if they haven't looked at him before, Warren Buffett Berkshire. But Warren Buffett Berkshire doesn't give more information than most people listening to this podcast will already have on him. Mm-hmm. So the only ones that are really interesting are Tom Murphy, Henry Singleton, and John Malone. All right. So and uh, the book Cable Cowboy probably has more information on the John Malone one. Let's start with Tom Murphy. Yeah. What is it that you like about him? Uh, so the record at Capital Cities is pretty impressive, and there aren't a lot of books or things written about that. There's some information from the time that he inv- um, merged with ABC uh, and then the merger with Disney. So it, things show up in those books about those companies, but there isn't really a lot that follows them from the beginning. Um, they made a lot of money, mostly in TV stations and to some extent newspapers and things like that. And um, it's one of the best records in media things. Uh we can see they do a comparison of each of the um, each of the uh, performances versus their competitors, their peers in the industry, and also uh, the overall S and P five hundred. That's a big part of this. It's a this is a let's see a Harvard Business Review book, mm-hmm. and so it is a lot on that sort of data. Um, they don't have as much as I would like of like actual interviews with the people and stuff. They claim they did a lot of interviews with them and stuff. But there's very little quotations from people about that or information and context on that. It's a lot of stuff that they took from like a database, basically, that they probably created. Um, so, like, as an example, uh, Tom Murphy and Cap Cities from 1966 on, let's see, he did 20% a year for 29 years. So 30-year record from 1966 to 1996. And um, media stocks in general did 13%. A year. Mm -hmm. So that makes a huge difference over time. What is it that you think uh, these CEOs did that allowed them to earn those incredible returns? Was it focusing on returns on capital and reinvesting the capital back into the business? Was it the way that they used debt? What do you think stuck out to you? Um, Maybe. I kind of disagree with the book in general. Um, I don't agree that there's much of a pattern between them. And uh, I think the book overlooks that fact. And also there would have been other companies that failed and stuff that used similar techniques. Um, I think each one is unique in what it did. They're all focused on capital allocation. Okay. So they all focused on the importance of cash. Um, that's probably the most important one, cash. We were talking the other day about a stock and you were saying that it earned low returns on capital and stuff. But if you look at the record of the company, it didn't earn low returns on capital. So I get that a lot from people because the reported earnings are, are low um, versus things like book value or whatever. But if a company has grown book value by 10% a year for 20 or 30 years, 
then its returns are 10 percent a year or, or so if it depending on if it's paid dividends and things for 20 or 30 years if free cash flow is a certain amount every year you know like if you look back at the last 10 years and free cash flow is over 10 percent of the company's um equity during that period right then it's also generated high cash returns these all did focus on cash. None of these focused on earnings per share. So mm-hmm. he's correct about that. They all ignored reported earnings. And I would encourage people in that in looking at stocks. I, w- I mean, most people I would say don't don't even look at the income statement for most investors because the biggest problems that I have when talking to investors about misunderstandings of the company are all from the income statement. Because they're looking at reported profits? Yes, as and opposed because to- they don't understand the income statement. It's very easy to not understand the income statement. It's much harder to not understand the balance sheet or the cash flow statement. It's very easy to misunderstand the income statement and to believe that what it says about certain things like reported income and stuff is accurate. Um, and not just accurate, but not... So because these people were capital allocators, they needed the cash to be able to pay down debt to buy back stock or to acquire new companies. So that's why they had a focus on cash flow. It wasn't to do it for investors or something. It's because they understood that earnings can't pay for those things. And um, but like I said, I think that he overstates the similarities between them. I think the similarities are fairly low with a lot of them, actually. Um, So we have some that barely use any debt despite the fact that in their industries, people use more debt. So you have like Buffett uh, and uh, Graham. So newspapers usually use more debt than the Washington Post did. Insurers and conglomerates always use more debt than Berkshire Hathaway did. Both avoided it. In the same book that has stuff about um, like John Malone, who targeted five times EBITDA, uh, five times debt to EBITDA at a time when that was kind of high for um, cable companies. Likewise, you also have things like Henry Singleton issued a lot of stock. Berkshire never issued stock, basically, you know, avoided issuing stock at all. Then you have in the same book that you have ones about people who heavily bought back stock. Singleton also bought back stock. But Buffett never issued stock or bought back much stock or paid much in the way of dividends. They all don't pay much in the way of dividends. Mm -hmm. So that is true. Um, And that's because of the focus on capital allocation. So they all saw themselves as capital allocators. Other than that, I don't see a lot of similarities between them. Okay, the allocation process should be CEO led, not delegated to finance or business development personnel. Mm-hmm. That's that's part number one. That's true. An investment committee of one. Yeah, investment committee of one. Start by t- determining the hurdle rate, the minimum acceptable return for investment projects. One of the most important decisions that any CEO makes. Yes, and I disagree with him. I don't think there's evidence that his firms did that. Generally, um, a few of them did. But I, I disagree. I don't think that they uh, that there's much evidence that these companies had explicit um, hurdle rates. And I think that explicit hurdle rates are more common at companies that aren't outsider firms. So I don't agree. So like, what do you mean by that then? <laughs> I mean, companies, he mentions ExxonMobil, but yeah. ExxonMobil is an outsider firm. But he gives the example that maybe they are behave like one. They use an explicit hurdle rate. Buffett doesn't. Um, I don't know that... Um, uh, I don't know that Malone did. Singleton didn't. Um, they used opportunity costs of other things they could do. And so they would say things like we could buy back our own stock because it's cheaper than buying another company. And so when they realized that they buy back their own stock, uh, but I don't think that they targeted specific hurdle rates and then didn't go through with a project unless it had that hurdle rate. Like for instance, my impression of Malone is that he just said a subscriber is a subscriber is a subscriber. So if I can buy subscribers more cheaply by buying back my own stock, then I should do that. If I should buy rural subscribers, then I should do that if they're cheaper. If urban subscribers become cheaper because those companies fall into bankruptcy and stuff and I can buy them that way, I should do that. But I don't think he targeted rates like that. I think he just tried to um, bring together the largest group of subscribers at the lowest possible price per subscriber, Mm -hmm. which is very different than a hurdle rate. I don't think he did calculations of what the returns would be on the acquisitions and stuff. Whereas I think that when we see anything prepared by investment bankers and stuff, it always includes hurdle rate assumptions and synergies and things for an acquisition. So I disagree. I don't think that there's any evidence that outsider firms did more um, actual hurdle rate stuff. I think that's like what someone from a Harvard Business Review things would say, and yeah. like, that's a good idea. And he gives an example about that too, about how you analyze a situation specifically about hurdle rates and what the return might be and stuff. Some of these companies did a little bit of that. There's some evidence for that. But in general, I would say it's definitely not a feature of outsider firms versus other kinds. Because you have to remember when you're studying a population like this, some of them may have done it. So here's the problems. One, you're thinking theoretically this is what they should do. 
So you've been taught that they should use hurdle rates and stuff. So you're more likely to find the use of hurdle rates, even if it's not there. Mm. But secondly, your control population may also have been using hurdle rates, right? So if you're comparing them to what kind of capital allocation is done by companies that aren't like this. Now, that's one of the problems in this book is that there isn't any in-depth study of the companies that of the other companies in the industry of the peer group. We get the overall stock returns of the peer group, but not stuff like, well, did Knight Ritter use hurdle rates when it made acquisitions and the Washington Post did or didn't? What you want to do is you want to find the Washington Post did use hurdle rates and others in the industry didn't or something like that. Sometimes this case is strong for the things he says, like early on, um, TCI outperformed other cable companies. TCI used EBITDA. Other cable companies worried about reported earnings. We know that and we can find it and see the difference in the population between the successful one and the unsuccessful one. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, they used uh, like performance in terms of underwriting uh, profit over time, the cost of float. And other companies in that industry worried more about more predictable earnings per share and more predictable premium growth. So like you can see that Berkshire's approach to insurance was totally different than other insurers because it allowed premiums to drop off huge at times and then it would triple premiums at other times. So it's a difference between the two of them. But that one I don't dis I don't agree with. I think that there's no evidence for that. Got it. Number three, calculate returns for all internal and external investment alternatives and rank them by return and risk. Calculations do not need to be perfectly precise. Use conservative assumptions. Yeah. So he's just going over the opportunity cost right there. Again, I see no evidence that his firms did that, the outsider firms. And in fact, not only that, I think that in general, there's evidence that the outsider firms separated those two functions. So the, the CEO did not, in fact, consider uses of capital inside the business. That was done by managing people. So if anything, that only got to the COO level. I don't believe at Cap Cities and stuff that Tom Murphy was looking at whether it made sense versus an acquisition or buying back your stock to invest in programming costs at some um, company there. I just don't believe that. And I think that in many cases we see that. At Berkshire Hathaway, I think that. I think at Berkshire Hathaway, they just charge them a certain amount for capital. At Teledyne, I think that they did budget and stuff, and Cap Cities did budgeting too. But I think that it was mostly suggested by people lower in the organization, local managers and stuff, CEOs of each of the, or presidents of each of the operating subsidiaries, what they wanted to spend on and stuff. But in general, I think that like Berkshire just charges them for capital. So they say, if you can find things that have 15% uh, or better return on capital or something, then do it. If not, don't. But I don't think that in the, for the most part, Buffett even sees proposals for doing those things. And I think at most companies, the decisions are made higher up in the organization about what to do all over the company. So I actually disagree and don't think that decisions at these companies about acquisitions mergers, buying back stock were made by the same people who made the decisions about whether to do CapEx on a plan or something. I think that was mainly separate. Number four, calculate the return for stock repurchases. Require that acquisition returns meaningfully exceed this benchmark. It's possible, but again, I'm not sure. I think that it, the evidence is that they considered which is cheaper, right? So they considered I can buy back my own stock and I buy back a TV station at a lower price than I can buy other TV stations. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they calculated the returns. That's another thing that I'm just not sure from the book or from anything else I've read about these companies that they actually calculated future returns. Number five, focus on after tax returns and run all transactions by tax counsel. So is yes, this again? That is, that, there's very strong evidence for that in the book. So that's absolutely true. These companies focus much more on tax efficiency, and most public companies have don't focus much on tax efficiency for their M and A and type stuff. We've talked a little bit about mm -hmm. that before. When it's very interesting when a company does that, um, it reflects their caring about shareholders and thinking about that in terms of value in a different way than most companies do. Most companies just think, "What can our reported earnings be?" and stuff. What can our stock price be? They don't necessarily think, how can I exchange this asset for some other asset without having to trigger taxes? Mm -hmm. And so that's a strong sign when you see that of an owner orientation. Determine acceptable conservative cash and debt levels and run the company to stay within them. Um, that's an interesting one. I don't know. Uh, that one bounces all over the place. So some companies took on a lot of debt at times, but then would bring it down. Um, some had very strong balance sheets. I'm not sure that they did that. I don't know. That's one of the ones in which the outsiders seem to differ completely mm -hmm. about what they thought was safe levels 
um, and also just things about whether they did do that calculation. Uh, so I don't know if they do that. And I think all firms do that. So that, that one, I don't really, what are your thoughts on doing that personally? Uh, well, does that depend on the business? It could depend on the business. I think that debt levels, I think companies rarely get themselves in trouble by having too much debt. I think they do get themselves in trouble by having too little cash and too much debt due at times, but I don't think that it's common for a company to have if it's borrowing over long periods of time um at fixed rates staggering the maturities i don't think that's usually how a company gets into problems i think that almost always companies get into problems because of liquidity problems um companies get into problems through financial engineering through liquidity problems companies always get into trouble for operational problems but like as an example let's take cruise lines or something right we were talking about them Mm -hmm. so cruise lines are pretty good thing to put debt on similar to like railroads, supermarkets, things like that, because a successful cruise line, a successful railroad, a successful um, supermarket will never have an operating loss. Okay. It's not cyclical enough to have that and com- competition in the industry for ones, once they're well established, just doesn't happen that much. So there's always income available to pay on debt. There's always cash income. In fact, usually, uh, unless you build a lot of new stuff. So because of that, you can always meet your interest payments, but you can't necessarily meet maturities that you have if you have too much debt due at once. So there are certainly cases where railroads failed. There's cases where cruise lines had too much debt, supermarkets go under, they go bankrupt. It happens all the time. So they did something wrong. What did they do wrong? Um, operationally, they could add things that fell into problems, but that's less likely. More likely is they had too much debt and too little cash. And I think that most companies we talk about run into that problem. So we talked about like GE, yeah. Lights Out and all that. Yeah. They didn't focus enough on cash generation um, at their businesses, and they relied too heavily on their credit rating and stuff. Yeah. They borrowed too much short-term. Almost all companies I see today, I think, borrow too much short-term, count too much on availability of cash from other people uh, in all circumstances, and potentially run into problems that way. As you saw with COVID, with companies having to issue stock and things like that, companies that are perfectly healthy had to do it because they didn't have availability of enough um, cash on hand. Mm -hmm. Um, Number seven, consider a decentralized organizational model. What is the ratio of people at corporate headquarters to total employees? How does this compare to your peer group? Yeah, there's that strong evidence for this. The companies that he, that the outsiders definitely decentralized. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was talking about. Um, It was like Buffett, right? How many people are at his headquarters? His was the most. 20 something. (laughs) His was most decentralized of any, but all of them were more decentralized than their peers from what we can tell. Um, I mean, he didn't have detailed information on the peer group, but they were all heavily decentralized. And that's because they weren't involved. Headquarters isn't involved in things like making decisions about strategy and stuff like that at, at the lower levels. But that's true. That was true at Teledyne, true at Cap Cities, all those cases. They, they were definitely um, decentralized. Mm-hmm. Number eight, retain capital in the business. Only if you have confidence, you can generate returns over time that are above your hurdle rate. I disagree 100% with that. Okay. I think evidence is that all these people um, retain capital at unusually high rates for their business. Uh-huh. They didn't pay dividends. Occasionally, they bought back stock uh, in big ways. So you could think of that as a return of capital. Yeah. But although they all talk about it, like Buffett talks about how Berkshire should consider paying a dividend and everything, they don't seriously consider it. I would say they, the outsiders are obsessive about allocating capital themselves, don't want other people to allocate it, don't want to pay dividends. And so actually they don't make that decision. So I would say reverse the evidence is completely the opposite that outsiders retain under anything approaching acceptable circumstances of like, they won't be um, seen as just holding on to that cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think they always want to have control over it. Yeah. These checklists, uh, this checklist is kind of funny because I just comparing a lot of these to Buffett, I feel like he would never do this. Like the next one, number nine, if you do not have potential high return investment projects, consider paying a dividend, be aware. However, that dividend decisions can be hard to reverse and that dividends can be tax inefficient. Right. So here's an interesting one. He has this as a checklist in his book, Yeah. but clearly he knows that they didn't, these companies paid very little in dividends and stuff. He doesn't really believe this, but it's usual like conventional wisdom that you're supposed to say this and you should pay a dividend if you don't have something to do with the money. Yeah. So that's why he's including the checklist. But obviously it's not 
correct. It's this is not something that these companies consider. They don't pay dividends generally. They pay as little as humanly possible. The only reason they pay any dividends is probably because their peer group pays some dividends. So yeah, number nine is no. It's they don't like paying dividends. Have you ever analyzed a company that has paid a dividend but then decided to stop paying a dividend for investing back in their business and then decided to pay a dividend again? I mean, most companies, when they decide to stop paying a dividend, it's because of like COVID, for example, where they're almost forced to just for, you know, survivorship. No, it almost never happens. So once a company pays a dividend, that that is a potential issue. Yeah. Um, And also, uh, he doesn't talk about it really here. But remember, the other thing is, if these companies are acquiring things, they need a low cost of capital. So a lower cost of capital is easier to achieve if you don't pay dividends to get to a certain level of um, size and stuff, which is important. So to get to some level of size and things, you would be then able to have a lower cost of capital. So if you're TCI or something in the early days paying a dividend, if a cable company pays a dividend early on, it has a problem that it's not going to have a low enough cost of capital in terms of its borrowings and stuff. Whereas TCI, by retaining and everything, was eventually able to get in a situation where it was able to lower its cost from its initial things of who it was borrowing from. I think they switched from borrowing from a bunch of banks to borrowing from like an insurance company and stuff, which lowers their cost of capital. Mm -hmm. Number 10, when prices are extremely high, it's okay to consider selling businesses or stock. It's also okay to close underperforming business units if they are no longer capable of generating acceptable returns. Again, another thing that I don't think Buffett would do, uh, like when it comes to like selling stock. Well, it's interesting, sort of. So there's some evidence that you know, Musk has shoot $5 billion in, in stock the other day. <laughs> yeah. There, there's some things that are interesting in terms of... So, the, the most famous example is Jan Marie. So, Berkshire complete... He did this a few times. So, in 1987, Buffett sold all of his stocks except for three. The per- permanent ones he was kind of focusing on at that time. And so, other than that, he got rid of his entire portfolio. In 1998, I guess, or whenever the deal with Jenry closed, um, he basically swapped a huge equity portfolio for a bond portfolio by issuing shares of Berkshire to swap them with shares of Jenry, which allowed him, without having to sell things, to get out of a portfolio that was heavily weighted towards equities, things like Coke and stuff, into something else. Mm-hmm. I think it's something he'd consider at times, but it becomes a problem. Um, and Buffett, by not selling, has that issue. Like right now, you know, he owns a huge stake in Apple. There isn't a tax efficient way for him to get rid of his Apple stake and convert it into something else, which means it's locked into something that could be he can't take advantage of if it gets to too high a price. So that's a problem that he has. Some of the others uh, did close business units and sell things, especially business units. that. So like some of the examples of outsiders he gives, that's definitely true. Um, a few of them were very big on selling out of stuff and moving to other things. The biggest examples of that, I think, are general cinema and uh, general dynamics. Um, in the appendix, he goes over the Buffett test, and the Buffett test is if a CEO created at least a dollar of value for every dollar of retained earnings over the course of his tenure. What are yeah, your thoughts and on he that? Includes the appendix, the table. The table is useless because um, it's by reported earnings, and this is a thing. Unfortunately, Buffett said retained earnings and stuff, but people had to focus on retained earnings when Buffett was talking about many of these things, the '80s and before then. Yeah. The problem is that for some companies, it doesn't work at all. Like TCI didn't even report earnings. And so when I've talked to people, it's an issue talking to investors because what actually matters is the amount of cash they retained in the business. It does not matter what the reported earnings were, and the reported earnings can be very misleading that way. So again, I just want to focus on the income statement. I look at how much actual cash do they build up. Mm-hmm. So you can do that by looking at like 10-year past record, add up all the cash flow from operations, subtract all the CapEx, how much did they actually have, and then did they pay out something or do something with it. So it, you get a number cumulatively, and that's the real number that you have that retain in the business. Same thing looking at successive balance sheets. You can look and see, okay, assets went up by $40 million or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. So uh, that's another way of doing it. It's not as perfect as the cash flow way because you're depreciating stuff over time, but still it's better than using an income statement way of what the earnings were and what was retained because companies may be retaining a lot of um, capital in the business even when they're not reporting any earnings Mm -hmm. and vice versa, yeah. What are your thoughts on companies that do that? And how would you value a business that does that, that retains pretty basically all their capital in the business and maybe they're not paying or they're not paying dividends, but maybe they're not even reporting profits. How would you value a company like that? Uh, I I don't know. It's hard to do. I mean, the, the kind of strongest rule of capitalism that's most backed up by research is that the faster and the the more asset growth you have today the worse your returns are likely to be in the future it's always easier to achieve higher returns on capital if you don't grow your capital very much 
if you grow your capital a lot, it's a lot harder. And you can generally, the best sign that returns are going to be lower in the future is if you increase your assets now. So if you see a company start to increase its assets rapidly, that's a pretty good indication that you're going to have lower returns in the future. And that works for industries too. So if you see strong asset growth in an industry, it's almost a guarantee that returns on capital are going to drop off. That's true in any industry. So if you start seeing that the steel industry is having its assets grow 10% a year or whatever, or banking or anything, it's a pretty strong sign that's going to go down in the future. And that, you know, it's a lot easier if you're a business that doesn't really take capital. So it's a lot easier if you can you that you can maintain high returns on capital, but it's almost impossible to maintain high returns on capital while having asset growth. Almost always. I mean, Berkshire and stuff too. It's returns over time are not higher. Um, any company we can think of that we even think of as being successful, generally its returns are lower now than they were in the past because they grew their assets too much. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I on the Focus Compounding podcast. If you have not read this book, go to Amazon and order it. Thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast, and we will see you in the next episode. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk general investing concepts. To get even more content from me and Jeff, sign up for the Focus Compounding app. The Focus Compounding app costs $7.95 a month. It comes with a bunch of 2,000-word articles from Jeff each week, a fresh batch of five-minute videos from the both of us, along with one bonus extra long episode of the podcast each Saturday and immediate access to our complete backlog of 200 plus episodes. To sign up, go to focuscompounding.com slash app or wherever apps are sold. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next podcast.